Another abduction in Nigeria as gunmen storm Kagara, Niger State, and abduct school children. And PDP governors charge federal government to decentralize the police. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anacom. Armed men have attacked Government Science College Kagara in Rafi, local government area of Niger State. At least one student was feared killed, while 27 students, um, three members of staff and 12 family members of the college were abducted by the gunmen. Discussing this with me today is security expert Dennis Amakri. Thank you very much, Mr. Amakri, for joining us. Yeah, good evening. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. So, of course, this is a yet another abduction. We just were happy, just rejoicing uh, a few months ago that the Kankara boys were returned home safely. And now this. And one would wonder, really, um, is this becoming a routine thing for these so-called bandits? I think uh, we are not approaching this issue properly. Because uh, Kankara boys came, they were rescued, and then now we have another Kagara uh, boys again. And uh, the reason why they are doing all this is because of uh, the cachet of bandits that are around in the country, in ungoverned spaces, trying to make money out of the Nigerian government. And uh, I think it's high time we face this. Before we were talking about uh, service chiefs, now we have new service chiefs. And these new service chiefs should go ahead headlong to deal with these guys because we know where they are, we know who they are. Really? And we should be able to get rid of them. Really? Do we know where they are and do we know who they are? So, what is stopping us? <laughs> What is stopping us from getting these people if we do know where they are and we know who they are? Because I remember clearly that um, um, a, a, a presidential spokesperson said that we cannot really um, give these bands, tag them terrorists or uh, proscribe them because we don't know who they are and they're not under an umbrella per se. So, but you're telling us that we know them and we know where they are. So what's the challenge? Whichever, yeah, whichever spokesman is saying that is not being honest. You know, I think we've got beyond the level where in Nigeria we will start being booted around the bush or trying to play politics with security. I don't like people playing politics with security. These are bandits. Sheikh Gubi went and met them in two camps. Where in one camp they have 700 persons with fully armed. In another camp, they have 600 persons, fully armed. All the coordinates are in the hands of the security agencies. Now, these guys are not, from other reports that we've had, they are not Nigerians. So if they are not Nigerians and they are occupying our ungoverned spaces, why should we accommodate them? So I think with the new service chiefs now, uh, I'm happy the IGP has already formed uh, uh, Operation uh, POF ADA 2 to go into ungoverned spaces. And I think there's a time for them to do it. Flush these guys out. Um, there seems to, like you said, you call them ungoverned spaces. Um, are we supposed to have those in the country? I mean, we know that there are... There are, there are, yeah, there uh, are many of them. Exactly. So why do we still have these spaces, knowing what we know uh, from when Boko Haram had been attacking and then uh, the federal government saying that we have been able to take over all of these states? Why do we still have these ungoverned spaces? I always keep asking security operatives this question. How do we let outsiders come into a country as big as Nigeria, as powerful as we are, to terrorize our people and then we still find a way to pay these bandits to leave us alone. Does this not mean that we are showing them our weakness and allowing them to um, play on these weaknesses and continuously find ways to 
take money, like you said, from our government. Um, what is the job of security operatives in those areas? Because I know that in the north we have JTFs, we have all kinds of security operatives, including um, local security outfits. Why have they not been able to map out those areas to cover these ungoverned spaces so that we can find out where these people go in and out from? You know, you are very, very correct that we still, why are we still having these ungoverned spaces? We have these ungoverned spaces because, number one, we have governors who are actually hobnobbing with these guys. There are pictures and videos of governors in the northern states who are having meetings with all these bandits. We have the Kaduna state governor who was paying them before to stay away. And now that they are not staying away, he is all for it that we should flush them out. You know, so we have all these people who are coming out from all kinds of countries like Mali, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Niger, to come into Nigeria. Now, why are they coming here? when other countries are also available. They can't go to Ghana. They can't go to Benin Republic, which is a smaller country than Nigeria. Because those countries don't want to deal with them. In Ghana, they are ready to fight them out of the country. But in Nigeria, we are so lackadaisical, our borders are so porous, and then they come in and do whatever they want to do. Mm. So this is the problem that we are facing. I want to dig deeper into this. Uh, I have seen, I've visited many borders in this country that are not in any way policed. And there are several of these borders. And every time we have occurrences such as this, or we have issues of terrorism, we now remember that we have borders that are under policed. But then once that face rolls over, we move on like business as yeah. usual. So now that we have new service chiefs and they've all been talking tough, we've heard them say all kinds of things. Why is there no concerted efforts to deal with those issues, those in and outs, especially from the northern parts of the country? I, I'll tell you what, um, for this kidnapping, the, the I, the I um, witness said that um, the school in itself was dilapidated and then there was a fence that was broken down. So those people were able to come in through those places. So it, it, this is a replica of what's happening in Nigeria. So we have places that are open to these people to come in, but then we cannot talk to the guys who are in customs, the immigrations. Why is there no concerted efforts? I'm talking from the presidency down to all of these people. The president, I mean, the bulk stops at Mr. President's table, whether we like it or not. And these people work for him. One of the reasons why I'm guessing Nigerians gave Mr. President this opportunity to be a president is because he was a former general and we were hoping that we wouldn't have to deal with things like this. So is it that Mr. President is not serious about the issue of security in this country or does he not just simply care? Well, he, he came into power saying that security is one of the major pillars that he's going to deal with. But anyway, as president, he's not going to do everything because when you look at the country, there are governors. Nobody's talking about the governors. There are local government chairmen. Nobody's talking about those chairmen. They are busy taking their money and their security votes and they're spending it the way they want to spend it. You mentioned the school. Look at that school. The gate is there and of course the sides are open. So that cannot be a perimeter fencing. In 2014, there was what they call Safe School Initiative, Safe School Initiative, which was put on place by the Economic Forum in Abuja. And it was supposed to create safety for all the schools in Nigeria. But you can see that school. There is no perimeter fence. All the schools are just there. They are sitting docks, and they can be picked. They go to one school, they pick up people, and then, of course, you have uh, uh, negotiations, maybe 
some kind of uh, ransom is paid, and then they spend it and go to another school. That is not what we expect. So the new service chiefs, I think, are more positioned. I think they are already thinking about it, and I think they are going to do something about it. Uh, I, I, I shudder to think why they should be thinking about it at this time. Should they not be steps ahead of these people, knowing that we've had precedences? But I want us to go to a video um, that's credited to the um, Minister of Defence and what he had to say about um, these kidnappings and uh, calling us cowardly. And he said that we should uh, not be cowardly, rather. Uh, we should defend ourselves. Let's take a look at that video. And when we come back, I'd like to know what you think about it. Is it the responsibility of the military alone? It's the responsibility of everybody to keep alert and find safety when necessary. But we shouldn't be cowards. At times, the banditry will come only come with about three rounds of ammunition. When they fire shot, everybody runs. In our younger days, we stand to fight any aggression coming to us. I don't know why people are running away from my mano, 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 thing like that. They should stand and let this uh, let these people know that even the villagers they have the competence and capability to defend themselves. But our own duty is to ensure no Nigerian is hurt and we are capable of pretend, uh, protecting the integrity of this nation, and we will continue to do it. So let, let's piece this video. Let's just, you know, take it piece in piecemeals. Um, firstly, he says that we should not be cowards, that it's not just the job of the army. And he also made a statement that eh, might, you know, make me a bit critical of him and, you know, the defense ministry, that they come with just very little ammunition. You're fighting a guerrilla warfare of sorts. It's not a technical war. It is a guerrilla warfare of sorts. And so you come with very tiny ammunition. What are you running after? Criminals? Again, he also says that in, the, in his days, we could stand and fight um, these sorts of people. It's 2021. What is a defense minister in the country telling the people of Nigeria that the army is incapable, that he doesn't know why he was put there? Or is it that we all should just bring our pots and our pans out and start fighting because our security agencies are overwhelmed? I think the, uh, the defense minister is regretting that particular statement that he made because I cannot imagine where he will call Nigerians cowards. You know, there are people that, he's the defense minister. There are people that are having arms. Even herdsmen are carrying AK 47s around, while the peaceful citizens of this country are disarmed and they don't have any guns with them. And they cannot defend themselves when somebody comes to attack them and you are calling them cowards. I strongly believe that I think the defense minister, um, I would say he was misquoted because I heard him loud and clear. We all do. I think he's regretting that very particular statement because I, I don't see him calling Nigerians cowards. Then why, are, why do we have the military? The military is there to ground these people and make everywhere safe and secure for everybody. So um, I, I think he's regretting that statement. I, I will not credit it, credit it to him again. Let's talk about the army or security agencies being overwhelmed right now because it seems that way. It seems like the army is being overstretched with um, banditry and farmers versus herders um, with all kinds of things that are happening in different parts of the country. And, and recently or lately, it's been the Southwest, you know, heating up. Um, and let's not forget the militants are still there, uh, you know, in the Niger Delta, even though there's not much attention coming from there. Is there something that needs to be done to strengthen, you know, the might of our soldiers, our battalion? Uh, is there something that needs to be done to help in policing our borders? Is there something that needs to be done? I, do we need to bring people from the other paramilitary organizations to boost the efforts? Because it looks like we have our plates full. Our plates are really full indeed. 
But I can tell you one thing. I thank God for the new service chiefs that have come. And I know some of them. So the thing is that, you know, they have a pressure on them to perform. And if they have to perform, they will do all it takes to make sure that the country is safe. It's just like a, a, a house that is filled with rats and the rats are running all over the place, you know. Uh, the way to do it now, number one, is to boost the morale of the fighting forces. Boost their morale, give them new equipment that they will need in fighting, take care of their welfare, and then, of course, they will provide, you know, they will go ahead and do what is needful. In the Niger Delta right now, we have a serious piracy and militancy problem. Yes. Many people Bonnie. are not aware of it. Yeah, in Bonnie, you know, there yes. There are many things that are boarded, okay? And in that kind of situation, we believe that the Navy is, uh, from the last time I checked, they are checking on all the uh, security equipment that they have. Uh, about last week, they went out for a sea operation, you know, 14 ships went, actually went out to, you know, uh, show uh, their strength there. So we believe that with the pressure on the new service chiefs, they will do something. Okay. The, now, the Senate uh, has urged Mr. President to declare a state of emergency. They did this, uh, I think, yesterday. Uh, we want to play that video, and then when we come back, we'll talk more about it. I believe that uh, there is need for something new, a different initiative on especially how to protect our schools. And let me be a little bit uh, clear about the incidents of abducting students from schools. Almost all the incidents of abducting students from schools happen in northern Nigeria. And we all know how much effort our leaders of yesterday, probably right from independence, have worked so hard to ensure that children go to school in northern part of Nigeria. And with incidents like this, we will be reversing all the gains that were made in convincing parents and what to take their children to school. So there is need for our security agencies and government to ensure that we come up with a strategy of ensuring security in schools. All right, so Mr. Macri, um, Senate President Ahmed Lawan there, you know, stating the obvious. Uh, for me, I'm wondering, Maybe this new abduction is a wake-up call, or maybe this is just another thing that the Senate does, you know, when these kind of things happen. Then we remember that there's strategies that we need to adopt. Or, but, but yes, the state of emergency issue. Um, people have been calling for it, even as a result of what's been happening in the southwest and in the north, um, as um, we have these issues of herders versus farmers. Now we have this banditry. So... Is this something that is feasible? Is it going to be all across the country or in those areas where these terrorists are more predominant? How realizable is this issue of state of emergency and can we really go through with it? Before the state of emergency, we have to think about the Safe School Initiative. The Safe School Initiative is something that started in 2014. Why are we not putting that project on ground? How to make the schools safe? Instead, that project has been abandoned. And there was a lot of money that was voted for that particular project. And when I see schools like the Boys High School in Kangara there, I, I feel very saddened, you know? But come to think about it, if the Senate president is now asking for a state of emergency, 
That means he's going to lose his job. Because when there's a state of emergency, all political institutions are on suspension. Hmm. All political institutions are in suspension. We call in the military to take over and there will be martial law. That's what the state of emergency is. Maybe some people don't understand that when you're calling for a state of emergency, you are actually calling for martial law. And when martial law comes, the Senate, the House of Representatives, the State House of Assembly, all of them will go to sleep while the military take over and everything will be done with immediate effect. So, so I hope they understand what they are asking for. So what strategies? Because we, everybody's just saying we call on government, we call on security agencies. As a person who's worked in security, um, what strategies do we need to adopt immediately? You've talked about the safe school initiatives. Yes, I'm guessing that for all of the North has gone, gone through, especially the northeastern parts of this country, what they've gone through, schools should have been policed and made safe over the years, we shouldn't be talking about this right now. But unfortunately, we are, so let's talk about it. Apart from safe school initiatives, what other strategies can be employed um, to deal with this situation in the interim while the you know, intel is being you know, um, combed for or something? I don't know. I don't know the, the words for the military jargons, but you know what I mean. While they're working on intel... What do we need to do in the interim? What strategies need to be put in place? Because these guys, I'm sure they're also re-strategizing to make another hit. Hopefully, if they get monies from this, um, they probably will be looking for something else to do. Maybe they'll hit another school. Very well. Now, there are some low-hanging fruits that we can deal with right now. And, you know, when you have all this kind of uh, kidnapping, so bandits go into schools, kidnap people, take them away. I was just discussing with a friend of mine today, a security expert too, who was saying that if we have to come to the nitty gritty, how long does it take a schoolboy to walk for five kilometers? Yeah. You know, these, these boys that are kidnapped are not, are not taken away in a bus. They are not taken away in a hillock truck. They were headed away walking on their feet. How long will it take them to cover five kilometers? How long will it take them to cover 10 kilometers? When people are abducted like that, Security agents are informed. Can't the police go after them? Because if you go after them, it will take them a long time to cover that distance. Mm. And within the first 48 hours, we should be able, even with the help of the Air Force, to know where they are. And then extricate them from whoever is taking them away. Mm. But we don't do that. We come around, we make statements, uh, governors come and make statements, and then of so, course so, by so, then... So my question, is, my question is, why, why don't we do it? Is it because we lack the um, uh, capacity to do it? Is it that we do not have the equipment to do this? Because I have seen drone pictures of um, you know, the Air Force bombarding some enclaves of Boko Haram. So really, is it that we do not have these things or we're just not willing to do it? We have these things. We have these things. We have jets, helicopters that are specialized in search and rescue. We have even the drone, the long arm drone, the long wing drone that we got from China. These are all drones that are available to us. They can go out and then, of course, they can see where these boys are and then deal with it. But when you waste time, when they are wasting time making political statements and everything, then they take them and then they, uh, you know, hide them or disperse them into different camps, and then it becomes very difficult.
to get them out. Well, it's quite unfortunate, but I want to say thank you very much. Dennis and Macri is a security expert. Uh, thank you for joining us on, on this conversation. Hopefully, um, we will get these boys back safely, and um, hopefully that's tomorrow. Well, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, we'll take a short break, and when we come back, we're still talking security, but this time, governors of the People's Democratic Party make a case for police decentralization. Stay with us. We'll talk about it after the break.